Welcome back to the channel. Now, the next part of the SIG saga. So from this point on, there were three groups. Um, there was Eason Smith's Raiders, the, um, the sort of LRDG, mostly New Zealanders, who are raiding Bachi Airfield. There is the SIG and Commandos in, in trucks infiltrating Tobruk itself. And there is the uh, LRGG SAS um, raid on the perimeter of Tobruk, whose mission it is to blow up the, uh, the DF direct fi direction finding uh, radio station. So those are the three sort of missions. Um, I'll start with one, um, and then see how much time, it, if it gets over sort of 20 minutes-ish, then I'll just make a second video about the others. But um, they all will be covered, it's just it's depending on how it goes. So so before the, the three groups sort of split off, they uh, they do something that's sort of uh, strange. The SIG actually put British uniforms in the cabs of the truck. Um, this is a precaution just in case it really goes bad. If they get trapped then they have enough time, they'll strip off the German uniforms and put British ones on. Um, remember, of course, that... I th what's that movie? Uh, there's a movie about Falschermäger attacking Britain, and they're actually wearing their Falschermäger uniforms under British um, uniforms. And that's sort of like this whole, well, if we get in trouble, we'll just rip them off. But the SIG is sort of doing something similar to that, where they, they actually have these British uniforms stashed. So um, they hadn't done that before. This was That was unique to this mission. Uh, they also got all the trucks that they weren't using, took the distributor caps off them, and buried them in front of, uh, next to the front left tire or front rear tire, uh, front, front front right tire. And uh, all the men saw this, and all the men were told, "If we have to get out of here, these trucks are loaded with food and water and supplies and weapons. This is where the the this is where we come back to. Uh, if we have to get out of here, these trucks will do it." Um, and then they had a truck which uh, had thrown a fan belt, which was really the only mechanical problem they had in the entire thing, which is amazing and astonishing because you read about other SAS stuff, and it's just constant mechanical breakdowns and constant problems. But the these guys had no problem with their dozen or more trucks. So um, they yeah, that one of them had sort of thrown a fan belt and it was not on the it's not on its last legs, but not great. So they they actually used it as a, as like a waypoint, as like a fallback position. So you would fall back to this truck. Uh, from there, they did the same thing with the distributor cap. Uh, there were some supplies there. And then you could just use the truck if you had to, or just use it as a rally point or a direction marker in, in the night to uh, to get back to the camp. And so the SIG set off with 80 men in three trucks into Tobruk. And before they could get to Tobruk, they had to get onto the highway. Uh, the only problem was they were in trucks... And they were, they were, so you have the highway here, the German traffic just goes across all day long. How do you get onto the highway without being incredibly suspicious? Uh, why would German trucks with POWs in them just be barreling through the scrub? Um, and they were very worried about this. And they sort of held their breath and gunned it towards the highway, but then they saw these two German cars, trucks coming along, and they're like, oh crap. If we keep going the same speed we're going, we're just going to slam right into them. But if we slow down or speed up, maybe that'll be suspicious. And so they they very slightly alter their course to come on just behind the German trucks. And um, the German trucks sort of slow down a little bit to see what's going on, but they speed off. They, they don't really pay any attention to it. Then they come to the outer perimeter of Tobruk, which is described as being... Um, basically, they're still using the same wire that the British had when they were there. Uh, and by now, it's just all filthy with rust. Uh, the Italians are, man are manning this section of the perimeter, uh, which is good for them because the German, <laughs> the SIG officers just sort of, um, get, oh, I should turn Captain Buck just leans out of the window with a bunch of papers that have his orders on them and just waves them at an Italian and sort of like yells at him and he just pops the gate up and they drive. So he, he just, Captain Buck just waves papers and the, <laughs> the Italians just let him in without even vetting them at all. Um, then they come sort of through the town and they... They describe the, the camp as the... It looks almost like a British camp, as far as they're concerned. And the guys are paranoid as hell. The, the, the commandos are really paranoid, and the SIG aren't. Um, and this is something that you see. The, the commandos in the SIG have basically the op opposite feelings. When the commandos start getting happy, the SIG get incredibly worried. Because uh, 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 it's just the dual positions that they're in. Um, so the SIG are uh, uh, pretty happy. They're fine. The commandos are very paranoid. Uh, until some of the commandos start realizing, well, why on earth would they be suspicious? Um, 
how many times have you seen a truck drive through British camps with POWs in it? Have you once ever stopped that truck and be like, hey, are they actually POWs in there? Is that maybe a deception force full of commandos that are going to come and attack us? So the, the commandos start to sort of relax. And then something happens that uh, puts everyone on edge when um, the SIG are driving through a crossroad, through an intersection. Uh, the first car goes through fine, and then the second car T-bones a German truck. Um, Captain Buck basically then makes a snap decision that, um, no, we are not going to stop, and uh, please proceed. And the SIG just hit and run, basically, and take off with <laughs> the dented fender and this very angry Germans um, screaming at them from their truck that's all busted up on the middle of this intersection. And unsurprisingly, a few minutes later, three motorcycles come out with uh, gendarmerie, with uh, uh, American military police, uh, sorry, American, German military police, and they basically start tailing the trucks through all the streets they're going through, and uh, they speed up and have a look at the trucks, and, and Buck sort of just goes, right, if we have to, kill the police officers and then drive on and, and try and get out of here. But um, the cops, the, 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 the gendarmerie must have eventually figured out that these aren't the trucks we're looking for and went off to try and find the guys who had just T-boned a German truck back there. So extremely lucky. But uh, unfortunately, all the screwing around, um, there was so much traffic coming into Tobruk tonight. There was insane amount of traffic for Tobruk. A lot of Italians, uh, lots of Italian traffic was just moving around and they were just constantly stopping at a, a crossroad, let this Italian traffic go and then you can go. And they ended up about an hour behind schedule. But uh, something that made the SIG feel really comfortable was they would stop at the crossroads and then just instantly fall into being German soldiers. So when the so the Italian guy sitting in the car next to him would just sort of look over, the SIG would you know throw insults at him and, and chat at him in the sort of way that the DAC chatted to the Italians and then Italians would chat back. One of the problems that the British had was Lieutenant Langton, who was one of the guards. But remember, the three guards of the zoo had uh, a driver and a navigator were both part of the SIG in all three trucks. But the three guards of the trucks were all just British lieutenants. And uh, Langton was the chattiest little little guy. Uh, Langton loved to chat, but he couldn't speak German. And um, he was just... <laughs> he was constantly being told, shut up, by the SIG guys, because the Italians would start talking to him. And he would just respond back with like, si, 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 uh, 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 viva, uh, viva Mussolini. It's uh, like just nonsense like that. And the, Ita the, the Italians would laugh because they figured it's just a German who can't speak good Italian. But the SRG are like, if a fucking German hears you saying that, just shut up. And they can't just punch him in the like, shut up, stop talking. Um, I'll just quickly mention this because I forgot to mention it during the thing. One of the things that the lieutenant with the big mouth does is when he's given an order by one of the, the Captain Buck in charge of the SIG, he responds with, Yavul mein Kapitan, to which Buck looks at him in freaked out friggin' horror, because if any Germans have overheard that, that's basically blown their cover. Because, of course, Kapitan is not what the German rank for Captain is. The German rank for Captain is Hauptmann. So this sort of schoolboy German, Kapitan, uh, I believe, is French. So, um, yeah, he this idiot schoolboy German almost blew the entire mission, so I thought I'd just include that. And the commandos thought that was very funny, until one of the commandos, uh, Hogan, from the uh, from the Irish uh, Irish Guard, uh, stood up in the back of the POW truck as they are flying through a German encampment, so tents on the side of the road, and he started pissing off the side of the truck into German tents, into German soldiers standing beside the road. And uh, Langton could do absolutely nothing about this, because Langton couldn't speak any German. What was he going to do to stop to stop Hogan doing this, and the commandos were just all laughing, and the SIG were getting very, very worried, so remember, as the SIG get worried, the commandos get happy, commandos think this is hilarious, that, that he's literally pissing on the Germans as they drive past, the Germans are starting to throw insults and, and stuff back at them, and then the SIG are like, what if we get stopped, uh, get him to stop doing that immediately, and, and the best Langton can do is sort of shake his rifle at the, at the guy doing it, and it does nothing, but, um, so the SOG are ridiculously on edge after this this idiot is just pissed everywhere. And they they are brutally on edge as they come to the actual checkpoint to get into Tobruk. And they they get through the checkpoint and then they, they're finally in the actual proper city. And they start going towards this dirt track that they need to find. They are going towards They're going towards Shaush Bay. I might get that pronunciation wrong. But basically they need to be at Shaush Bay. Um before the air the air raid starts, and they need to disable the guns, uh, 88s and other and bigger guns, 
disable them to facilitate the landing of troops, which is basically the main goal. And on the way to Shosh Bay, they drive past the their final objective, which was the uh, bomb-proof oil and fuel depot, which is like built into the, the actual cliff face and the, uh, built into like the rocks. And one of the commanders is like, "We could probably blow that up with a couple of grenades right now. It's that exposed from the ground." But they they grit their teeth and drive past it, and they they try and look for this dirt road. They just can't find it. They cannot find this one dirt road, and they're now an hour and a half behind schedule. And they just keep looking and looking and looking, and then they see it. They see the dirt road, and they drive up to it, and then they stop. And the guys in the rear cars cannot figure out why they've stopped. They get out, and they have a look, and there is a wall uh, built exactly where that dirt road is. There is a wall blocking them off from the dirt road, and there's no way around it. So these guys who are trying to sneak into Tobruk, sneak into Shawosh Bay, can't. Like, the, the, there's a giant wall stopping them. And they weren't... This is new. This was not here when the British were here. Everything else in here has just been the British defenses adapted to German use. This is new. Uh, so they just... They... They have no real... They don't really have a backup plan, which is strange. So their plan is to just turn around, drive back up, and then try and go in the main gate or, or find another way into Shosh Bay. And as they do this, they hear, bang, bang, bang freak out and it turns out that is actually the warning sound for air, air raid imminent um, they've seen the first few planes fly over and drop illumination flares and um, these were sort of like dual purpose flares where you would blind gunners to the aircraft and you'd also illuminate targets for bombers one of the first missions of the, uh, the US Army Air Force in, in North Africa was one of these with their B-20s uh, yeah I, can't, I don't know my airplanes but the bombers that they would have used in this sort of thing uh, mostly British but there were some Americans involved as well and uh they're like, we're supposed to have already pretty much be just about to attack the 88 guns by the time that st that happens. So um, we're not even anywhere close to the objective. So they drive down the road. They eventually find the main road to Shellish Bay. And as they're driving up to the main gate, they hear the sirens start. And when the sirens start, just 50 feet that way, massive bright light goes off. 50 feet that way, massive bright light goes off. 50 feet over there, massive bright light goes off. And it turns out this is the 88s that they're supposed to capture are now pummeling the the air with with firepower. Like the the main set of 88s that are actually watching the harbor have uh, gone into anti-aircraft role and are firing up at the aircraft. So they're they're sort of sitting there going, "Well, we didn't have to take them out now. Our job is not to stop them hitting the air raid. The air raid is the cover for us." So they they weren't concerned with, "Oh no, we." failed so now pilots are going to die because they weren't supposed to stop that happening in the pilots they were meant to as long as they take those 88s before the ships come in they're fine but they're worried because they're meant to be settled in by now they're meant to have all their equipment laid out um, by this time they've just thrown the blankets off and they're just holding tommy guns and stuff they have them down but they've got their their guns and rifles and grenades and, and machine guns ready uh i the only people really, the only guys who would, st the British you know, commandos who are still not in British uniform are the, the guys with the trench coats on who have been the guards. Uh, and they go up to the German gate where they are stopped. I'll leave that story there because that's a sort of good cliffhanger. And I need to tell you the other two stories so that you can actually find out the big reveal that I've kept in view for this whole time about why a lot of stuff that's happened actually happened. Um, and all the little inconsistencies that have come up in the story so far, all the little things and all the... All the little the weird points that... Why did that aircraft not spot them? Remember the other week when they were driving across past that uh, Italian fortress? Why didn't that aircraft spot them? Why were there no aircraft in the air? Why are there so many damn Italians in Tobruk? Why are they driving around crazy like madmen? Why has no one even attempted to stop us so far? All those questions and more will be answered at the end of uh, the next video, I hope. So thank you very much for watching. Have a wonderful day.